Greetings and felicitations. Hip, hip, hurrah, tally-ho. Give me a little Georgia Peach. Hey, Puddin. All right, let's talk about a classic Star Trek episode, The Conscience of the King. Original air date, December 8th, 1966. It was written by Barry Trivers, directed by Gerd Oswald. It did have some unique featured music in there by Joseph Mullendore that is a jazz version of the Star Trek theme. Kirk is given reason to suspect that the leader of a troop of actors is actually a mass murderer, Kodos the Executioner, and he beams the troop aboard the Enterprise to study them, as he, Kirk, is one of the only three surviving witnesses who might identify Kodos. One of the other witnesses is killed, another poisoned, and Kirk still isn't certain. The episode takes its title from the concluding lines of Act Two of Hamlet. The play's the thing, wherein I'll catch the conscience of the king. Let's listen in to some comments that our friends had when we watch it together in a group setting. This is Gavora, and this was always a good episode. Um, so this was really the first time... Uh, like, like if you watch him, if you were watching them in order from the beginning, this was the first time of Kirk's really um, k- kissing a woman on screen. Mm-hmm. Before that, there was there were sort of hints at it, at at him being a ladies' man. Mm-hmm. This is the time we really got to see it. And let's see other interesting things. I mean, that it was the conscience of the king. That Star Trek has always made lots of references to to Shakespeare. This was. I think this was the first one, but there's uh-huh. later on in, in the original series and other episodes. And the, the great story about the, uh, the past with, with Kodos the Executioner. And that, you know, Kodos actually sounds like it could have been a Klingon name. It could have been uh-huh. <laughs> Kodos the Klingon Executioner. But anyway, the story was good. And I liked, I liked seeing Kevin Riley again. This was only his second appearance and last appearance. Uh-huh. I always thought he would have been great as a regular. I, I liked how it how it ended with it, with the twist. We find out that that it was actually his daughter. Even though I mean, I'm sure some people suspected it anyway, but it was a nice twist at the end. And the way it turned out with Kirk, always wanting to be sure, he never was really sure. And maybe in some ways, he didn't really he he didn't want it to be true that the actor was really Kodos. Yeah, yeah, he was really afraid that it was him. And it was neat that no one else, like, like only a few people had seen him too. And now, and, and now Kirk and Riley were the only ones left that had seen him and knew what he looked like. And I like how Spock was, was always suspicious. I mean, Spock was able to figure out what, what the same thing, like what Kirk was thinking about Caridian. And he knew that he, he was pretty sure, like, like logically, it, I mean, it had to be him. All the, everything just fit in place. So I like, I like how everything fit in well and how the characters worked very well in this. This is Vicki. I really uh, like the Shakespearean part because I've been watching a lot of Have Gun, Will Travel lately. And Paladin, it gets me when he quotes from Shakespeare or something else like that. Um, but also the, the guy having to make the decision for 4,000 people to die so that 4,000 could live Makes sense to me. And, and remember the uh, movie where there was three spacemen in the ship and they were running out of oxygen and one of them decided to take a walk outside to save the other two? It remind me of that as well. Yes, that, yes, Vicki, this is Galen. That would have been one solution. And I think, Derek, I think he should, uh, should have did a volunteer thing plus a lottery would be the more humane way of dealing with something like that, at least in my mind, since I am wise as Solomon. (laughs) Uh, Enjoyed this episode very much. Uh, I thought William Shatner did some of his best acting here, along with the episode of Balance of Terror, Mm -hmm. and the one where the creature that takes people's blood out of their body. I'm trying to remember the name of that one. Obsession. Yes, Obsession. 
Uh, I like the uh, more serious episodes of Star Trek that are less on humor. And uh, I love the, the morally complex questions I think this raises up. Like, for example, in Balance of Terror, which came before this episode, uh, Kirk has to make the decision, does he hunt down the Romulan ship and destroy it in order to save lives because the last thing they want is Romulans to see the Federation as being weak. Mm -hmm. And the Pale Moonlight episode of Deep Space Nine, uh, Cisco, you know, he's willing to break the rules to try to draw the Romulans into the war against the Dominion because the Federation is losing it. And then Garrett, the Kardashian Taylor, goes even further and uh, kills the Romulan ambassador to con the Romulans into thinking the Dominion debt. And at the end of the episode, Siskin is asking himself, can I live with this? And uh, so I love these uh, complex episodes of uh, Star Trek. Uh, hi, this is Mal. Um, so I always forget until I see the, like, original Star Trek, how relatable Spock is. Because, like, just all that kissing and romanticness with Kirk is just, ew. <laughs> um, <laughs> it is, it's gross. I like it, I like your um, Also, in regards to the Hamlet play, and the Shakespeare and the Hamlet, Hamlet at the end was a good, like, tie-in because of all the ghosts and the ghosts wanting the uncle dead in Hamlet. That just, it was one of those beautiful, beautiful moments. And something I noticed that no one has said, if you look carefully, the daughter's hair becomes messier as she becomes crazier. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like it's just very subtle, but it becomes messier as she gets crazier until the end where it's basically just a ball of fuzz. Mm -hmm. Hey, this is Nayar. I, I love this episode. I was trying to think, when, when I was a kid, this might have been the episode where I thought that Star Trek and Twilight Zone were had those type of endings that was a twist ending. And because this reminded me of that. Twi I was fascinated with Twilight Zone as a kid. And this is one of the ones that you went like, what? I thought I thought it was the guy, but it's his daughter? Oh my God. Like I really liked this as a kid. And and the funny thing is this is one of the worst episodes uh rating wise in its initial airing in the first season because it was considered too much talking for the audiences of that time period, which I, I find that kind of curious because the the storyline is compelling. The pacing is even. There's no dead spots in it. There's, there's no boring spots in it. But I think it's one of the stronger Star Trek episodes that doesn't get enough recognition. And I also love the fact that it pulls in from continuity of other background characters we got to see kevin riley again initially the script called him a different name but they saw that the actor that they put into the to the scene they said wait a second he he's recognizable we need to find out what his name was previously and make a link there i love that i love seeing lieutenant leslie at the council so we're, we're we're seeing that the enterprise is more than just the the standard crew that's on the bridge all the time and they actually have names and personalities. So in so, ma in so many ways, this is really a wonderful episode. One of the questions that comes up is, uh, you know, if you're in Kodos' shoes and you had 8,000 people and all the food pretty much had been destroyed, there's still a little bit left, you know, what do you do in that situation? Do you continue to give equal portions to everybody knowing that, the supply ships will probably not arrive until everybody had starved to death. Or do you start making decisions and say, okay, well, we'll feed the children the smallest portions to keep them alive, and maybe other younger people, but people that are sick have, with illnesses, people who are in their 80s, do we continue to give them food knowing that all these children could die from starvation? You know, those to me are complex questions. So I think this episode condemned Kodos, but I thought he was put in a tough spot. My personal solution would have been, I like the laundry idea. I might have just drawn a line, and everybody, 50% of the people, based on age. The youngest ones get to live, and uh, the others, I would not have killed them. You would offer them water, and just, uh, but whenever the uh, lack of food kills them, that, that's how they die, unless they were to choose peaceful euthanasia, something out of selling your grain. Uh, but I'm curious what others' thoughts are. If anybody would... Have just given equal portions to everybody, knowing everyone could starve to death, or what else might somebody have done here? 
It, it was a hard decision. And, I mean, it's hard to say what anybody would actually do. Like if you were in charge of these people and, and you knew that there was only enough food to feed half of them, the, the idea of having a lottery and taking volunteers it is a good idea. And, and I think part of it has to do with, like, how soon, how soon would people starve? And could something be done immediately or could something happen gradually? Because, I mean, how, how soon would people starve? Or, or was there enough time that some people would just go crazy? I mean, it, it probably would be a situation where it would be hard to keep people from killing each other in this. If some people were that desperate and knew that, that they were going to starve to death, they would kill other people and try stealing food and everything else. So um, it, it's a hard decision. And, and as we were watching the episode, I did think it, it was interesting that, that – Kodos became Caridian. He became an actor. I mean, why would he do that? I guess it was something it was something to be completely different from what he was, but maybe also as an actor to explore different sides of himself. He was but, a player. Yeah, a player. As they, they called him in, <laughs> in 50s and 60s, like the actors were called players. Um, the, back in the, yeah, we were watching the old Universal Monster movies, and they list the players. Yeah, which was the list of yeah, actors. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. yeah. That, that, isn't that a... Derek, you would know more so. About I'm not it. finished. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I thought we were having a conversation. Well... <laughs> You're going to be on the couch tonight, pal. <laughs> That's not very far away. <laughs> you can finish it. Uh, as, I, I, well... I, I <laughs> As an actor, and he was one who traveled, and so he he was putting himself out there where other people could see him. I mean, I guess only like if, if he knew that only nine people could identify him, I guess then it would be it would it wouldn't be that likely that he would run into people who, that could identify him out of everybody out of all the planets in the galaxy. But then, and so he didn't know. I guess that his daughter was probably arranging for them to, to go to the certain places where the people who could identify him were there, so that, so yeah. that she could kill them. And it's amazing nobody had thought of that before. That everywhere these people go, somebody dies or something like that. Okay, no. Derek, is there a reason why they called them players years ago, and then, and then they in movies they called it cast. You've got me there. I do not know the answer to that. That's a good question. Yeah. So we could see this. they were called the players even in the 60s, though. So uh, it was just one of those things that it, it's, a, it's a term we don't use nowadays for, for actors. Uh, what do you think about, you touched on it a little bit, that this is the episode that solidified Kirk as a ladies' man. Because early on, they did not want that characteristic for Captain Kirk. They wanted him to be very diplomatic and serious. Wasn't this Janice Rand's last episode? I think she was only in the mm-hmm. first 13. Mm-hmm. And you saw she, I think she only had like one little scene there. Yeah. When Kirk basically ignored her. <laughs> yeah. I mean, as a kid, this was my Captain Kirk. There's no doubt about it. I mean, Gene Simmons, James Bond, and Captain Kirk were my role models. So, I, I mean, I... I I loved him going forward like this. With Janice Rand, yeah, she was in this, and but she didn't even have a line. But you, you know, you, I mean, of course, you recognized her. That was her. So, and they they dropped her because they wanted Kirk to be able to mm-hmm. to to um, at least flirt with other women, or for other women to be attracted to him. And and there was another story that the actress was having drug problems and had to leave the show. Mm-hmm. So wh- whichever, but. Yeah, yeah. So the ladies' man thing did kind of take off, take off later, and and it was, it made sense because Kirk was a handsome guy, and he he fit in that part very well, and William Shatner did it very well. And since she mentioned too about William Shatner's acting in this, I mean, it was great because he didn't do any of the overacting in this one, mm-hmm. but he could still do the the charming parts very well, and the the captain taking charge, he he could do that very well. This was a very well done episode. And we got to see the observation deck. Anytime I get to see an extra piece of the ship that we don't normally see, I love it. Because it just adds, adds more to the mythos of the Enterprise. I still just think that Kurt, like, flirting and the sexual t- t- tension is, ew. 
Just <laughs> ew. <laughs> he seems to be enjoying himself. Too yeah. much. <laughs> too much. I think. I think Kirk reflected the alpha males of the 1960s that were everywhere. And every, don't watch the show Mad Men if this made you uncomfortable. <laughs> uh, yeah, good thing I've never seen it. Because unfortunately, the, things were totally different of what was acceptable. I think a lot of us our age and younger cringe at some of the things our fathers will say to waitresses and restaurants and that they'll touch them and stuff. And I'm like, Dad, you can't do that. <laughs> you know, that's not appropriate. You can't do that stuff anymore. Stop it. It also you know, doesn't but, help that personally I'm asexual, so no one is sexy, so... Spock is kind of like a mainstay comfort character for the asexual community because he's like, no, while Kirk's all flirty and hands. What did you think about Captain uh, uh, Mr. Spock in this episode? His reactions. Extre- for someone who's not emotional, he had quite a few reactions. Well, just we see Spock is always concerned about his doing his duty and uh, any... Anytime the captain begins to step out of line in his opinion and putting the ship at risk, he will not hesitate to speak up. Uh, I think it is the obsession episode where Spock goes to McCoy and then they go to Kirk together and say these acts you're taking of putting the ship in danger with this creature. You know, what's going on here? And Kirk has to explain himself. So I think this is just why Spock is the one everybody needs on an organization that will hold others mm-hmm. accountable and uh, when they start to step out of line. And speaking of Spock, what about the banter with him and Bones? There, there wasn't the, the same kind of banter here, the way the way Spock and McCoy would go sometimes arguing. I mean, this was more, I mean, it, you know, because we've seen it be more comical. And, mm-hmm. and this one, it was more serious. Spock mm-hmm. was, and, and it was interesting that Spock went to McCoy when he had suspicions about what Kirk was doing. And Spock goes to McCoy and says, you know, this isn't right, and... And and McCoy, in this case, instead of being the one who's um, upset or anything, he's he's just thinking, well, that Kirk is being the captain. Mm-hmm. So that that was a neat play, and I and I think it's because this is one of the earlier episodes that it was a little different than than the way they have their scenes together later on. Hmm. But yeah. yeah, as I said, like I do, I do like how Spock was able to take charge in this and. And, you know, when Kirk told him this, it's, that it's my business, and Spock said, well, it's, it's my business if it concerns the safety of the ship. So and Spock Bones did, yeah. in saying, Kirk, he's doing his job. Yeah, yeah. That, I mean, even McCoy like, said Spock is yeah, right. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Especially since before Spock figured out, like, what was going on with the whole play thing, he was just like, hey, we don't need to make this extra trip. Mm-hmm. For you to flirt with this girl. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it was excessive. They were going way out of the way. Mm-hmm. I have a question. Has Barbara Anderson, who played the daughter of Kodos, mm-hmm. has she ever appeared at a convention? I don't remember meeting her anywhere in that the Las Vegas ones or anywhere else. She's still alive, like at 82 now, but I just wonder if anybody knows if she ever goes to conventions to meet fans. She probably has been to Vegas too at, at some point, but mm-hmm. but yeah, I'm not sure. Mm-hmm. But you're a Spock person, right? Because I am too. Yeah, I always like Spock was always my favorite character. Yeah. And again, as I said, for the whole asexual community, Spock is just like one of those general characters that we go towards because every community has like that character that people used to represent them. Spock is one of the biggest ones. Hmm. Spock just, and SpongeBob SquarePants. <laughs> just out of curiosity, what other characters? like the asexual community like from Star Trek. Do you think of anybody um, else? Out of Star Trek, no one else immediately comes to mind. The Vulcans in general usually are pretty good, but Spock in particular. Um, from Star Trek, I can't think of any others. There's plenty of others from other types of media, both sci-fi and others. And, but it was at this, probably about the midpoint, within within a dozen episodes or so, Leonard Nimoy was getting more and more fan mail. Yeah, Especially from, from ladies. Yeah. yeah. So it's interesting, interesting observation there. Uh, with regards to Barbara Anderson, she was having some, I don't know what, facial eruptions or something. She, she was having some problems with her skin, so they started using the lighting a little differently, using some shading. And I actually thought that it was more dramatic, putting some shading in those areas as opposed to just doing the soft lens like they normally do. So they took 
you know, they they had lemons, but they made lemonade out of it. And I, I thought that's another thing of the look and the feel of the original series is just so fantastically unique. We had the option of watching the original version that's unedited or the one with the new effects. We watched the original one, and it's beautiful. It stands up 55 years later. I have another question. Uh, Nichelle Nichols, is this the first episode where we get to hear Ahura sing, or did she do strong musical talent before this? Yeah, she, she sang in Charlie X. Mm-hmm. So, that yeah, that was the first one where she sang. But she did play the, the Vulcan, Vulcan liar, and sh- this is the only human that we've ever seen in the Star Trek universe holding that instrument. So this is this is a, a Star Trek first in many, many ways. So everyone agrees. Great episode, huh? Yep. Thanks for listening. Make sure you hit that subscribe button and join our Facebook group. Live long and may the force be with you. Nanu Nanu.